Welcome to Career Talk by the Paisano here at UTSA. I'm your host, Andrew Dotson, and today we'll be talking about cybersecurity. For that, we have brought on sophomore Patrick Adam. Patrick, would you like to introduce yourself and what you currently do? Sure. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Patrick Adam, and I am currently a sophomore at UTSA, cybersecurity major. Um, background is right now in cybersecurity and data analytics. I've been a cybersecurity advisory um, individual for the last 15 years. Um, prior to that, I've held positions in HR as well as being out in Wall Street, beginning my career in New York. That sounds very nice. Uh, and it actually sounds like uh, IT is very flexible. Do you want to talk about how IT can apply to various different industries? Because said you actually worked in HR, which I find very interesting. Yeah, IT plays a role in everything. Uh, it plays a role in Wall Street, plays a role in HR, plays a role in cybersecurity. Um, it's an enabler. And when you have IT, you can break it down into a variety of different areas. Um, typically, you would start with hardware software. And then within those parameters, you can go ahead and break it out into different fields, whether it's networking or if it's application development or application security, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, in each of those different areas that I've been in, IT's always played a major role, whether it was automating trades and portfolio services in Wall Street to HR systems and helping uh, expedite the process. Um, shifting through resumes, let's say, that are coming in. Um, IT's always played a vital and critical role. And then later on in my career, just playing in the sandbox with regard to cybersecurity and how it impacts uh, application development, what are some of the best practices, what are some of the tools that you could use to enhance your coding skills so that you don't create vulnerabilities, um, as well as networking, pen testing, and so forth. The list goes on and on. That, that really does sound like a long list. Uh, but there's something you said that kind of caught my attention. And you were saying uh, hiring managers. And uh, as most people probably know, hiring managers are the people who decide if, if you get a job, usually. Uh, so it sounds like you have a lot of experience in the industry. So I feel like you might be one of the best people to answer this question. Uh, what are hiring managers looking for when it comes to the IT industry? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Um, that depends on the company. That depends on the manager. That depends on the role um, within IT. And I'll call out cybersecurity specifically because it's a bit more niche. And you know, this is a podcast about cybersecurity. But um, Ultimately, for students, as they go into the interview process and they're looking for their first job, internships may be a little easier, but once you've graduated, now it's finding that new role. And in most cases, especially when you're looking for something that's entry level, uh, it's really difficult to find that opportunity simply because hiring managers are typically looking for someone who has experience. It's really difficult for cybersecurity managers out there to get a budget more, more or less in having the ability to hire someone and put a body into that seat to go ahead and whether it's analyzing red flags or false positives, um, just somebody who's familiar with that work who can just come in, start right off the ground. Um, in many situations, uh, what a candidate can do is alleviate some of that anxiety from the hiring manager. Again, hiring managers, they say entry level, but they probably prefer to have somebody with one to three years of experience so that they don't have to walk them through everything because it just takes more time away from them as they show the new employee, here's where this is, here's how you do this, here's how you do this. It takes time away from them being able to do their job. Um, Going into an interview and picking the niche, you know, depending on what position that you apply for, and let's use, for example, application security, and understanding what in, what's entailed with application security and understanding that arena. So while you have a vast knowledge of cybersecurity, having more specific knowledge around application security 
and the tools that are used and why do you do certain things like threat modeling or pen testing or some of the tools and the vendors out there. Um, I asked, 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 um, all types of um, approaches to doing application security alleviates a lot of that concern from the manager so that they know, all right, this person knows the jargon. They have some level of understanding as to what we're doing here and why we do what we do. Uh, it might be a little easier to get them off the ground and running sooner rather than later. So having a good idea when you walk into that particular opportunity in that interview with that hiring manager, understand what the job is actually asking for. If it's generic and you're applying for a generic cybersecurity role, uh, it might be a small company. So they're going to have you do a lot of this, that, and the other. Um, if it's generic and it's a much larger company, I probably would ask, you know, if you're going through the vetting process, what specifically are they looking for in that particular role? That That is all very interesting. I, I especially found the part about uh, the entry level true because I, I speak from experience. I have looked for entry level jobs in the past and I have found that a lot of them that actually say entry level are not really entry level. Like, I, I feel like the definition of entry level has been changed from a job where you can start out your career to a job where you transition from your first job. But like, a question that I have, and probably other people would have too, is how do you find that first job? Like, where is a good place for these students to go look? Because usually when you're in college, a lot of the time you don't really have experience. No, that's a, that's a good question. And, um, you know, th there's a couple of ways that you can approach finding that first job. So the first one's probably the most logical one, which is the internship. So as you intern with a company, um, it's getting acclimated with that company, getting to know the folks over there and hoping that you know, they're going to bring you back for a second internship or at least extend the offer to you. Now, whether you're interested in going back or not is a different question, but you'll want to latch on to them. And typically when companies are doing internships, they are technically looking for their next hires, right? Where are they going to come from? Um, these are also opportunities for companies to get somebody who's going to be cost effective, who's going to fit within their budget, right? So they have their requirements and their needs as well. They have a reason why they're bringing interns on. Um, so that's probably the first avenue that I would say is more logical for obtaining that entry level job. Uh, the second one is probably, aside from putting your resume out there, uh, attending associations, networking. Um, here in San Antonio, I have the ISSA meetings, and they are held quarterly. And during those meetings, and I used to be a director on the board there, but um, we would have folks stand up and introduce themselves. Now, if it was members from a company, they would talk about the positions that they had open, or if it was a student that was attending the session, um, the student would say, hey, I'm entry level. This is what I'm interested in. It could be networking. Uh, it could be access management, whatever you know, portion of cybersecurity that they're interested in. Um, and then hopefully somebody in that room will be interested in collecting their resume or at least their information to go ahead and offer them an opportunity. So networking is really important. Um, also LinkedIn, uh, just reaching out to folks on LinkedIn, um, you know, maybe messaging them. Uh, I wouldn't be too intrusive and, you know, overwhelm them with a lot of content, but you could certainly knock on their door and say, hey, listen, I'm looking for an entry level job. I saw that you've got a couple of opportunities, you know, maybe asking for some advice. Me personally, I try to help folks out, whether they're on LinkedIn or if it's on Reddit, for example, I'll join some of those communities and folks are out there saying that they want to do a career change or if they're looking for a new opportunity, I'll go ahead and provide some advice as to what what are some of the things that they should do versus what they shouldn't do. Um, but yeah, networking would be the other avenue. And of course, working with your counselors at school, you know, they attending those career fairs, um, that's probably uh, another opportunity provided that there are enough of those career fairs, because unfortunately, when you're doing those career fairs, um, everybody's there for the same exact reason. So the competition level, you know, there's only so many positions that they're going to have open. So it's very competitive. Um, and also any... Um, you know, my son just recently did this, but also partaking in any um, opportunities that may 
be beneficial to put on your resume. For example, hackathons. Um, so for example, Harvard has hackathons, MIT has hackathons, as well as many of the companies out there, JP Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, and so forth. Uh, they all host hackathons. So being able to go out there and sign up for those hackathons, uh, if you're in cybersecurity and you happen to like doing application development and maybe have an, an interest in application security or pen testing, that would probably be something that would be great to put on your resume. Uh, even if you don't win, just the thought of having the ambition of going ahead, signing up, getting accepted, and then partaking in that just alone shows your interest in a particular area and that you're going after a particular niche. So performing something like that will probably stand out on your resume when you apply. I know that was a loaded answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, near the end there, you know, you, you know, I keep noticed you using this word niche and, you know, interests, specializations. Uh, and I think one problem that even I personally have is that I'm interested in everything, and I don't really think I can just put myself into one umbrella. Because one of the great things about just IT as an industry in general is that it's very flexible. Like, you can go from, say, doing pen testing to... Uh, being a security engineer, like that, those are two completely different jobs. They're similar, but mm -hmm. they're still different at the same time. And they're both still in IT. So I guess, would you say you have to have a specialization? And if not, or if yes, uh, why? So I bring up specialization because it depends on the size of the company that you're applying or working for. Um, the IT skills are transferable. The question is, which ones do you prefer to use, right? So you want to be happy at the job that you're currently working at, right? Um, <clears throat> and then if you're working for a larger company, there are more people in your IT infrastructure. And when you have thousands of people, let's say a large company, and you have thousands of people in IT, it becomes more niche. So you're not going to have somebody doing network security as well as application security. That's unheard of. What you are going to find is somebody who is maybe doing application security and they do a particular role within application security. And I'll use that one because I was an advisor uh, previous to my current role um, in cybersecurity for application development. Right. So how do you create secure code? How do you test it? What are your threat models? Uh, those are all the things that you would apply in just that particular role of application security. And then you write up your findings, and then you have to apply that to a vulnerability list that will then be applied to policies, right? So many of these organizations, or especially in the financial industry, you're going to have regulatory requirements and uh, policies adhered to the type of threat or the type of vulnerability that you find. So it becomes very niche. Right? So having a good understanding as to how to use and understand the tools that you're using or in that particular area is vital. You can't use the tools for application security that you would use in, you can't use those same tools in on the network side. It's a completely different animal. Um, so again, finding, and there are so many niches within cybersecurity, within IT itself, but uh, when you get into cybersecurity, it becomes a little bit more um, focused is probably the best word I could say or use here to describe it because You've got incident response, you've got privacy, you've got access management, you've got application security. Um, you can get into network security as well, and then that has its own outlayers and branches of, all right, I'm going to be doing either this, that, or the other. Um, you could also go on the innovation side, things that you probably wouldn't have thought of. Right? So you don't have to necessarily be sitting there fending off the world and trying to prevent people from getting into your systems, but you could actually be innovating new ideas and generating new opportunities to enhance your security posture. So roles like that do exist out there, whereas opposed to you know sitting there and doing your nine to five security and looking at red flags and alerts all day long, you could be sitting into a lab and innovating as to what's the next thing that we're going to do. Are we going to utilize machine learning, let's say, to enhance our ability to eliminate false positives on the network side because we get a billion pings a day, right? So. Uh, there are so many opportunities. It's just a matter of taking the time to read about it and nailing it down as to which one seems to interest you the most. 
that that made a lot of sense. And honestly, uh, I I guess right off the bat, I would say the one that would probably interest me most is maybe being uh, I am architect. You know, uh, designing the actual infrastructure to fulfill the authentication part of a you know workspace. You know, like uh, authenticate into Office, authenticate into Google. You know. Those kinds of systems, because I mean, I actually also, I, I, I have a job currently, and in there, I actually did design a whole system, and even designed some single sign-on implementations for some third-party system, so that way you can have one login for everything, which I think really is one of the coolest things, in my opinion, about IAM, is that you can have one login for everything. It can be insecure, but if it's one of the most secure logins, you know, like you, you know, like you lock it down by IP address, you, you enforce uh, MFA, you know, multi-factor authentication, you know, if you do all those things and then you have like a hundred character password, let's say, uh, then that can be very secure and it cuts down on how many logins you actually need to remember. <laughs> Yeah, access management, um, which is probably one of my uh, key areas um, of knowledge. Uh, you can, it depends, on, again, it depends on the company, uh, depends on what it is that you are looking to protect. Um, you've got IM, you've got PAM, uh, privileged access management. Um, social engineering is one of the easiest ways to go ahead and get right past everybody. And that's usually the most common one. It's the path of least resistance. Um, for access management, uh, depends on the organization, uh, the size of the organization. What are your capabilities? What does your IT infrastructure look like? Uh, MFA is good. You know, it's a speed bump, but it's not 100% secure. You can easily overtake somebody, um, you know, in their credentials. You can do an account takeover. It's not difficult. Uh, it's just a matter of what speed bumps do you have in place and how well does your IT infrastructure speak within its domain? So, for example, um, if you are an organization that has a mobile app and you also have a web-based uh, website and you also have customer support, right? So you could call in to do whatever business it is. Uh, I've just named three different avenues right there. So cross-channel authentication. And if I authenticate in one does it carry over to the other, right? So many of these things need to take place on the back end. And then you have to look at all the types of fraud and how would someone penetrate and get into someone else's account through authentication. Now, if you have MFA and you're going to do a recovery through email, well, there you go. I just compromised somebody's email address. So no matter how many times they try to recover, I'm going to go ahead and reset it because I'm the bad actor because I have access to their email. So MFA is somewhat defeated right there until they realize that they have to change their credentials in their email account. Or, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, they're, you know, they can't get back into their email account. They're going to have to look for another method to go ahead and reclaim their account. Um, there are biometrical um, opportunities out there, and it's not just your fingerprint or your face. But voice, you know, so you have active voice, you have passive voice. Um, not sure how much longer they're going to be sufficient uh, with regard to, you know, authentication simply because AI now has this great ability of going ahead and replicating voice. And there's probably more testing that needs to be done to see the level of accuracy versus the tools that are out there monitoring that type of voice print. Uh, because they do adjust the voice print over time. So if somebody calls in enough, uh, with AI, that could make the adjustment to their favor. Um, I'm not going to get too deep into that one right now, but you know, as technology matures, so do the threats and the attacks. So you just need to harden your systems and you just need to come up and be creative with other new ways of collecting information. Um, but yeah, behavioral biometrics, uh, there's many things that you could do out there from an innovative side that you can implement that can, again, create more speed bumps. Uh, 
lengthen that path of least resistance. You know, and every bad actor is going to look for the easiest way to get there. If it's going to take too much time, uh, they're probably not interested unless, of course, that bucket of gold on the other side is well worth it. Um, but yeah, technology changes constantly. And just an access management, talking about a niche area, you need to understand the reasons why you do what you do and what it is that you're protecting and what that infrastructure should look like. Um, you also have the user experience. So from the business side, you can enhance all of your cybersecurity that you want. Um, but if it is not user friendly, um, now you, you have the risk of losing business. So there is some level of risk acceptance when you're building out these new solutions and access management, for example. I, yeah, there's, there's risk everywhere. Uh, uh, and I can't, it's like, I, I originally actually didn't agree with you that MFA was bad until you mentioned the email compromise and that, that is something that. I mean, I, I, I just, just, my eyes just shot over that. So I don't doubt that a lot of other people do as well. Uh, because what I was thinking originally was, well, I mean, if you have a Yubi key, you know, the only way they're going to get access to your account is if you can steal that key because it's a physical thing. But then, like, if they somehow find a way to, you know, remove that designation from your account, instead of a place to would say phone authentication to put their phone number in there, then MFA would essentially be useless. Mm. But I mean, YubiKey is still, like, a, a, a lot of companies have been embracing YubiKey. Google, I think, was the most recent company to implement passwordless authentication into their uh, ecosystem. Yeah, um, I've worked with Google in the past with regard to authentication. And we had some interesting conversations and the, the data that they collect <clears throat> and look to use. Uh, I can't really go into it too much, but it does allude to the password list authentication. Uh, it's a little different than some of the conversations I was having with them, but ultimately uh, it falls in the same ballpark. Um, going back to the innovation side of cybersecurity again, you've you come up with a great idea, they're going to find a back door to get in. So you constantly have to reinvent, uh, innovate, and you know, test it. You know, testing is a key thing. You know, what if? You know, we do those scenarios so often. What if? How does somebody, you know, one of my favorite ones is, you know, somebody got into an accident, their car went into a ditch, it went on fire and blew up, and they don't have a phone. How do they call their insurance carrier? Uh, but they need to authenticate, right? So how do they authenticate if they have nothing? They don't have a device. They're borrowing somebody else's phone, but they need to do this now because they're stranded in the middle of nowhere, right? So what if scenarios are great to go ahead and pen test and see if whatever it is that you're doing actually works? It, uh, that, that was a very interesting example you just gave. Very interesting example. How do you authenticate uh, no authentication? I I mean I see what you're saying though. I really do. Uh but you keep mentioning that word innovate. And you mentioned like evolving uh while the threats evolve. You know, like evolving at the same time that they do to try to get one step ahead of them. So I mm -hmm. so I am curious, uh, have you ever invented something and had it, you know, essentially get superseded by threats? Um so I've worked in innovation before, previously um, in cybersecurity. Uh, the can't get well; they're public. So um, some of the inventions, for example, are credit card fraud um, with security codes, continuous rotating. Apple actually uses it right now. Uh, any app authentication. So if you're trying to authenticate in one platform, you can authenticate in a different one. And that, But you have to have that infrastructure set in the background in order to do that. So not all companies are mature enough to do something like that. But if you have cross-channel authentication capabilities in the back end in your infrastructure, these are things that you could go ahead and do and go from one vehicle to another. So, for example, web to mobile or using mobile to authenticate in web or using mobile to authenticate in a voice channel. Um so not superseded, um, but not everybody is ready or mature enough to actually go ahead and deploy that. So 
when you're in innovation, you have you know your three stages of innovation, core, adjacent, and transformational. And these were probably a little bit more in the end of adjacent and into transformational, where they're somewhere between three to seven years down the road, maybe 10 years down the road, because the infrastructure has to catch up. And if you don't have the infrastructure, great idea can't be implemented. Um, but what you do try to do is strive towards getting that infra- infrastructure set up so that you can implement newer technologies. And a lot of companies do that over and over and over. So a lot of money spent in IT keeps everybody employed, um, especially in cybersecurity. There's a shortage there. We need more people. We just need managers to you know, be true to the entry level voice and say, hey, you know what, we're just going to have to grind it out and get them, you know, get them up to speed. Let's give them the opportunity to learn from others. That That's very fair. Uh, and honestly, it sounds like uh, you really have done a lot. I mean, I, I've never invented something. I bet most people who are going to listen to this have not. But I, I bet probably some professors have. I it kind of honest. It, it sounds a little bit more like university research almost in the job because I mean, you know, when you're in research in a college, you know, you you do things like that. You know, you cur- you research things and then you can get new things from that. Get data things. I mean, it just sounds. It almost sounds as if IT is kind of tied into research as well, which goes back into what we into what you were saying in the beginning, like IT ties into everything and a lot of aspects life maybe not every aspect but a lot of aspects but i but we haven't really talked about your job much we we've heard bits and pieces but now i actually kind of want to get to the nitty-gritty of your job uh what do you currently do uh and what did you do in your previously mentioned advisor position so I'll, I'll work backwards. Right now, I'm currently in data science, so decision science analytics. Um, it's beneficial. I, I kind of, I'm involved in not only the financial side, but also execution as well as other efforts like cybersecurity. Um, typically, when you have issues in cybersecurity, the question is, what, da- what is the data going to tell me? Where are my where are my areas of opportunity where I can make an impact as far as securing my cybersecurity uh, footprint? Um, where are the holes? Where are the where are the breadcrumbs? And where's that trail leading to? You have systems deployed in cybersecurity that collect a ton of data. The question is, where's that needle in the haystack? Do I have a data leak, or uh, how are people committing ATOs, account takeovers? in our access management journey you know is it through our voice channel or is it through our mobile app or the website uh where are those pockets of opportunity that we can go ahead and patch those up so the data is going to tell you a lot of what you need to know uh so that's my current role right now is in uh, decision science um understanding what the data is trying to tell us and then adding additional attributes to tell a better story and have a better understanding as to where those leaks are occurring so we can patch them up which direction should we be looking at um think of a network analyst who gets a billion red flags you know gets a billion pings a day and has let's say for argument's sake a hundred thousand red flags they're not going to be able to look at a hundred thousand um, the question is, which ones should they be looking at? Which, what's the least common denominator? What are the anomalies? You know, where's that needle in that haystack? Um, that's where data comes in. That's where your analytics component comes in. And you need to science out that data so that they can have a better opportunity of catching um, the actual issue as opposed to looking through a ton of false positives all day long, which happens quite often. Uh, systems are only so good, but when you start combining data from other systems, uh, there may be an attachment there or a correlation. Um, prior to that, prior to my current role as a cybersecurity advisor, it's going in and basically trying to understand what are the issues that companies are having. Um, in many cases, cybersecurity departments have a really difficult time trying to get the budgets that they need um, because they're a cost center. They're not providing any revenue. But they could always make the ar- argument that, hey, we're keeping you out of the paper. You know, if they're a large company, it's probably true, right? They, 
if you didn't have a cybersecurity footprint or not a good one, chances are nobody's going to trust your business because you can't keep it protected. Thus, you go out of business. So cyber, cybersecurity has a valid argument as to why they need budgets. It's just that typically they are tampered down a little bit, and it's a struggle for many CIOs as well as CISOs out there to get those budgets, the ones that they feel that they need and are necessary. Um, my role was going in and helping them understand what their what their areas of opportunity are as far as improvement, reviewing their current systems in place or their procedures. Um, what are some of the best practices? Uh, what are some of the things that they needed to do in order to elevate uh, their return on their investments? So application security was one of those areas. Training was another one or pen testing. Uh, some companies, they may be doing pen testing internally, but they never really had anybody going externally uh, accessing their network or at least trying to access their network. Um, so you've got those blue team, red team exercises internally. You can also hire a vendor from out, outside to go ahead and conduct those same services. Um, application security is a big one because most companies, they're pumping out applications, they're constantly developing, but you know, what they aren't aware of or what they don't necessarily test are some of the most common vulnerabilities that you'll see out there. You know, you can go to MITRE and look at your CWEs and you'll see it all day long where it's cross-site scripting or C-surfing or SQL injections. Um, how do they prevent that? How do they get better? Uh, part of it's education and teaching their developers to be better coders, better developers. And the flip side to that is your security team, their posture. Uh, what tools should they use and have in place? Should they be using DAST or SAST or implementing IS so that the developers can see what the errors are as they're coding, right? And then remediating them and then understanding what those policies are so that they could get better at it and reduce their, their vulnerability footprint. Um, you'll see some companies go out there and they will go ahead and... Um, Oh, I forgot the term that they use, but basically you're going to go and get paid if you could find any vulnerabilities and report them. Um, many companies will do that. Uh, they'll go through like GitLab and so forth um, to collect that information. But again, you know, uh, going out there and helping people know what they don't know. And, you know, it's really difficult for your C-level executives to understand or know everything that they have in place. And if they do, it's a matter of tweaking it. So not everybody needs everything. Um, in some cases, they just need a particular thing. And that's where that niche comes in, right? Understanding it because they don't want to do business with someone who doesn't understand their business <clears throat> and more so doesn't understand cybersecurity. Yeah. Uh, I definitely feel a lot of that, especially about the ones, uh, what you mentioned, budget, budget. And it's like, I, it's like, Cybersecurity really is just a glorified cost center because I mean, it, it doesn't make you money. You're right. It's like, but I mean, they protect the company, which is why you know I always think it's like, so you have this philosophy of not paying for the things that protect you. So I'm like, you you only get the things that give you profit, and it's a problem, obviously, like you said, because I mean, if you aren't investing money into cybersecurity then you're going to get smacked hard pretty quick uh, when a breach happens. And see, the, the, the thing about cybersecurity is breaches are never an if. They are a when. They will occur no matter how secure your things are. I mean, even uh, putting things in a locked down cabinet, you, 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 know, you know, air gap computer, that's what they call it. If, if you, even if you have an air gap computer, there are still ways to get in there. Rather, it's physical, which would be the easiest way to do it, or through some vulnerability. Because there have been, uh, rec in recent times, there have been uh, exploits uh, to where you can get in air gap computers. And I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> uh, so, I, yeah, it's it's never an if, it's a when. So it's it sounds scary. But the thing that I think everybody has to realize is, while that is true, the more you do to protect yourself, I would say the longer you can put it off. And so, like, for example, it's like you were saying earlier, it's like companies take, like, 10 years 
to actually upgrade the infrastructure to support some innovation. Well, with that, uh, what if you didn't wait 10 years? What if you had all the money in the world, you upgrade the infrastructure immediately, uh, the moment something came out that required it, and you wanted to implement that? Then, theoretically, every time you did that, you'd just be pushing it back more and more. And then you start to slow down, hackers catch up with you, then you reach. Uh, so, essentially, w with that example, uh, like, like, e e like, just consumers. It's like, consumers are probably... Consumers are more likely to get hacked than companies, just because they don't really have a cybersecurity department. But consumers also don't really have to worry as much, because unless they're running a web server, there's not really much to hack, per se. I mean, you can hack the platforms that you're on, but that's why people always say only sign up for what you feel is safe. It's like, I use a term for this. It's like, you go into an area you're unfamiliar with, uh, and then you just feel in the vibes, bad vibes, so then you get out. Same thing with internet safety. And I actually wrote an article about this on the Python. I don't know if you guys want to read it, Art, Arts and Life. Uh, essentially, if you go to a website and you feel like it's very suspicious, then just close the tab. It's the same thing as real life. And with that, uh, do you have anything you want to add to that, Patrick? <laughs> no. no um, <clears throat> for c consumers out there, um, you know, the differentiation between a company protecting themselves versus a consumer, and then the consumer being the shopper and looking at the companies. The consumer also needs to have a decent enough cybersecurity profile. Uh, not that a bad actor is going to go through the consumer to get access to a company, but more so an account takeover, right? Um, what is it that the bad actor is trying to do? So are they trying to collect data? You know, they'll probably go after a company, get their list, sell it out on the dark web, or are they trying to get an account takeover so that they can, <clears throat> you know, Take ten thousand dollars out of the person's, or what is it, nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars out of their savings account, right? So I think there's a ten thousand dollar trigger there for most financial institutions. So, um, but that individual has to make sure that they have a pretty good posture, right? So antivirus software, don't click on links that you you're not aware of. That's why you know uh, there's a training component, right? So some of the most common things that a cybersecurity student would be aware of and say, yeah. You're not supposed to do that. Most folks out there don't know, right? And if they don't know what they don't know. And next thing you know, they say, hey, I can't access my bank account. Why is that? Well, they clicked on something that they weren't aware of, propagated in their system. So now the person, the bad actor has all of that information and has now access to all of their accounts and is withdrawing left and right. right? So now they can't get back in. They try to reauthenticate. You know, it goes through that vicious cycle, Um yeah, it's difficult for the consumer. So, you know, uh, the consumer needs to, I don't want to say have that same approach as a company does, but they certainly need to make sure that they have the proper safeguards in place. Well said. Well said. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and j just some general things. Uh, not that the majority of public would do that. Just uh, the number one tip that any cybersecurity person would tell you, just have different passwords for each website. Most of the public is probably not going to do that. But mm -hmm. if you do, then at least if one account gets breached, not everything is. Unless it's your email address, then, well, that's a different story. That's a different story. Because nobody in cybersecurity is going to tell you, go create an email address for each different account you create. Because you could, it would definitely limit it even more but what would be the point? It's like you'd have to keep up with 500 email addresses and you wouldn't know which which email is sent to what. It's like you have one for LinkedIn, one for, let's say, Google. You have one for Steam. It's like, you know, it's too many to keep track of. So, like, so like I'd say passwords are the best way to do it. And the longer and more complex they are, the harder, well, the harder they are to crack, really, because you're not really going to have somebody try to brute force your password, unless it's password. Uh, 
but we won't get into why that's bad. You should know why. <laughs> but I think uh, we might have time for like one more discussion. So uh, why don't we uh, talk about AI a little bit? Because I, a AI has become a big thing, and you did mention uh, way early on, I think when we first started, uh, how like things are just changing too much. And AI is definitely one of those major changes. So how do you think AI will impact cybersecurity, not just for it, but also in it? Like, like how will that change it? I don't know. Um, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, AI is caught on. You know, there, there are... So, for example, it's not that it's anything brand new. It's just that it's something that is now readily available to all. Um, <clears throat> machine learning is a very big um, approach to cybersecurity, uh, especially when you're dealing with large data sets. Like I mentioned earlier, looking for that anomaly or that needle in the haystack when you're looking at a bunch of data. Um, over time, as you collect that data, you start to say, this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. Um, there are companies out there that create um, their product based on machine learning and based on data that they collect. And that comes into behavioral biometrics. So when you're talking about passwords, the only reason why passwords exist are simply because of the... Um, let's say folks who do not want to use uh, behavioral biometrics or they don't want to use any of their biometrics like face, voice, and so forth. Um, they, you know, you have your policies, for example, with authentication, know your customer. Right? And um, not everybody wants to remember other things that companies would like them to. So uh, your older generations, you know, they want to use their birth date right? That's an authenticator for them. They, you have to use that because if you don't, they're not going to do business with you. And that's your risk acceptance criteria. And that's why some of these antiquated methods of authentication still exist today. It's not because we don't have things to replace it. It's because of the user experience. If you eliminate that experience, you won't have a user anymore. And that becomes an impact to your business. So you could have the best cybersecurity footprint in the world, but you won't have any customers and that becomes an issue. So methodically, you need to walk through that process, research who your audience is, what is that percentage? So anything that you look at, um, you have to do your due diligence and research. Um, with AI, we would need to do more research. You know, uh, I alluded to voice, for example, earlier. Some of the things, you know, you've got the music industry right now that is up in arms because I can have Jay-Z doing background vocals to one of my songs. <laughs> not that I'm a singer, not that I should be singing, but you know, Jay-Z will certainly help me sell some of whatever it is that I'm going to create. Um, that's all through AI. That's a, a possibility. So doing the research as to, and from a cybersecurity standpoint, what are some of the limitations that it has and what are some of the possibilities that it can create because I'm going to have to now look at everything that I have and see what I need to do to basically improve my footprint. Um, can AI create SQL injections, right? Can it create the code for a SQL injection? Now I've tried that before and it tells me that it's illegal and whatnot. And that's the correct answer. But for somebody who is a script kitty that wants to go out there and, um, create some code and test and play, they could simply do that. So AI enables some of these capabilities, voice. Um, and voice is a critical one because if you can authenticate in, there is so much fraud that you can do if that is one of the ways or passages that a company will allow you to authenticate to access an account. Um, that's, a big, that's a big gap right there. You know, companies are just, some companies are releasing authentication, whether it's active voice in their IVR channel or if it's passive voice, um, and they're implementing that. <laughs> they spend a lot of money on it, and now here comes AI, and it's able to replicate my voice to authenticate my account. Well, what good is what I just put in there? That's how fast technology changes. So it's researching it. It's seeing how viable, how effective it is before you make any changes or any movements here. And is it is AI currently being utilized 
in a malicious manner, you know, account takeovers and so forth. So, uh, don't know the answer as to what it can do. Um, I can only imagine what it can do, but I know that there are probably quite a few cybersecurity departments out there right now just thinking about what are all the holes and the gaps that AI can address that now we're really going to have to dig deeper into. And it's also going to be an education as well. So training is going to be a key piece too, because you're going to have to be a bit more alert and be a little bit smarter because AI is pushing it out there as far as the information and its capabilities. So delineating good versus bad is just going to be that much more difficult. You, you're just on point in everything you say, honestly, because uh, I have had to walk back some cybersecurity things myself. That that was what really made me chuckle a little bit, because... Uh, yeah, uh, your customers essentially decide how cybersecurity is implemented. Like, like they don't really decide, if you know what I mean. Like, like how they operate. It's like it, it depends on how technically literate essentially your customers are. If if they aren't that tech literate, then you might not be able to do some of the more advanced things that you would have wanted to do. But it, things are also limited by implementations because not all software supports everything you want it to do, even if you try to custom build it. Because trust me, I've, I've tried to custom build things a couple of times, fallen through. Yeah. And with, with AI and abuse, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of this, Patrick, but there there is actually people have been developing ways to get past that filter that you mentioned, that, you know, this would be a legal message, and make it actually do whatever you tell it to. Mm -hmm. Essentially becomes your personal AI servant. And that, that right there is, that, that that's a little scary. And uh, you might not know what it holds for the future, but can, but would you be able to speak to, as to how much of a threat is this going to be for consumers? Because this isn't even... Like, it can be a business threat, because uh, uh, cybersecurity people have actually generated uh, business uh, compromise emails, BUC emails, uh, through it just as a test, and those were, they they were pretty realistic. It's like, you get rid of all the grammar errors and everything just by itself, so they're even harder to detect. You know, like the old Nigerian print scam, that, mm -hmm. that, that had... I have gotten a couple of those in the past, and they have grammar issues galore. And most of the time, people will tell you, you want to tell if an email's fake, just look at the grammar. That's not really true anymore. No, you could use AI as your weapon in many different ways. Um, with regard to AI, uh, a lot of it is also going to be decided based on your governments. And so governments are going to put certain levels of restrictions in. I know that the EU has, to a certain extent, um, the United States hasn't, but I'm sure it's being evaluated right now as we speak um, as to what should be available, what shouldn't be available. Um, it's going to be interesting going down that path as we uh, move forward. Well, uh, that is actually all the time we have. Uh, and I just want to thank you for coming on today patrick and just sharing your story sharing your story with everybody and you know it was really nice talking to you i'm pretty sure that uh the people who will be listening to this uh will learn a lot because i i know i did yeah my pleasure more than happy thanks for inviting me thank you uh and uh everybody this was a uh, career talk and uh i'll see you next time thanks for watching Click our logo to subscribe or click the videos for more from the Paisano. Leave a comment letting us know your thoughts and what you'd like to see us cover next.